All right, in this video, I want to go into the Mandela effect in a little more detail, expanding on the last video on the subject. And just to start, um, kind of a minor correction slash update from the, the video on time that I originally uh, uh, linked this article. Um, if you go down, this is from the scenes in 2015, and this is a store blast from the past. And down here, it says the a Baron Baron Stain. <laughs> see, even when I say it, like it's gotten to the point where I I see one and then I say the other. Uh, the Baron Stein bears lunchbox, uh, E I N. And it's not uh directly visible just from when you when you look at this uh, little screen cap that they took here but if you if you open up the movie and you uh you bring this scene up this is from part two it, it actually zooms in from this point and you get a, a clearer view once you know where it is and there was a comment on the last video um let's see here Oh boy, it's here somewhere, let's see. Uh, it's so annoying how they always have the top comments up first. I mean, maybe there's a way to change that, but I haven't investigated it in any event. But um, it was from uh, Damone Mildrew, I think that's how you say that, I don't know. Um, but uh, in a comment down here, in this string and again I still haven't updated my browser so look what it does when I do that it does this weird thing where I can't even view the comments anymore uh, so I didn't plan enough ahead for that but in any event so he he or she I assume he I don't know there's a there's a disproportionate amount of ma of males in this uh, in this information but um, so he actually went after I brought this link up he actually went and uh, and looked at this, and he found and went to the even went to the extreme of looking at old Baron Berenstein Bears lunchboxes, and he found the one that you can you can uh, barely see. It's like right in the this little area right here, um, and it's definitely the bear. But of course, you can't see the label, right? Um, so. That kind of gets into the idea of okay, well, who is behind this wiki? Is it? Uh, I mean, I, I I think I know from other, like for example, Lost has a Lostpedia, and I know the people behind that weren't involved directly with the show, at least on the surface. That's what they tell you. Um, so I assume that the people or person behind this this wikia is not. Um, directly involved with Back to the Future. That that said, they do pay attention to what is considered non-canon and what is considered canon. And it says the non-canon or disputable information ends here, and then it has all of these things listed. So, um, you know, I can I can at least see the argument where someone would say, oh, well, this person must have just had that, that memory of the EIN bears, and they put that here. But you got to think, like, I guess... Uh, then again, you'd have to do further research into when the year exactly that this was created, because um, if it's always been Berenstain AIN, then depending on the year that this, you know, this came out, it would make it more or less likely that someone would make the mistake, quote unquote, of putting it as EIN. So that was interesting. And then th that commenter also had a hilarious observation about the opening scene in Back to the Future Part 1. And if you look, when the dog food uh, is opened out of the can, it falls down here, and the the splat uh, of the dog food comes right over the E-I in, oh, really, right over the E in Einstein. And, uh, I mean, that's just, you know, kind of a hilarious, quote-unquote, coincidence, right, that... Uh, in addition to this supposed Berenstein EIN lunchbox in Back to the Future Part 2, which I don't need to tell you Back to the Future Part, all the whole entire trilogy is just like, 
it is a, a Masonic masterpiece. Like they have encoded so much stuff into it uh, subliminally. So just just the fact that this splats right over the E in Stein is kind of in combination with that is kind of hilarious. Like, okay. Um, I, I think this says it all uh, as far as what's going on here. But uh, so that's where I wanted to start. That was the first note I had up here. And then uh, I wanted to point out some comments that really sort of refine the way that I was viewing this situation. Uh, and the first one was from the one that I, uh, well, I, I read uh, a comment from him also on, on the last video, but this was a, a one left on the Mandela Effect video. And he says, imagine the analytics at Google's disposal. How many searches are conducted via Google on a daily basis? What do you think they could do with that information? For one, they could compile, compile a list of the most commonly misspelled names, brands, uh, misquoted movie quotes, etc. If they wanted to fuck with us, they could take these most common mistakes and start making claims that these things have been changed. It's much more likely to me that the Mandela effect is truly a psychological operation, uh, mindfuckery, rather than a physical conspiracy to slightly change the names of serials and children's books and cliche movie quotes. Do you really think it would be feasible to change, for example, the spelling of Townsend on every Who LP ever pressed? I have a number in my possession and everyone spells his name with an H. And, um, you know, I, I really, I, I agree with this um, for sure. I think this is a really good point. And the only, uh, like, especially when there was another comment, uh, so, somebody left the comment that, to the effect of, um, is this like the new hip way to refer to things from the 90s, the Mandela effect? And I just kind of laughed, and that sparked the thought in me, like, you know, it is kind of interesting how this could be viewed, uh, if you're viewing it from the perspective that we are viewing it as a psychological operation, this could easily be, be viewed partially as like some guerrilla marketing that is that is targeting all of these people that are that have turned off the television or kind of outside of that standard uh, marketing channel. And, and now all of a sudden we're discussing all these bullshit corporations and their products and, and these uh, ridiculous uh, uh, toxic cereals, you know, that, that should be burned in a, in a trash can rather than consumed, you know? So, so I just got, that made me laugh a little bit. I was like, man, maybe this is uh, part of this is like just some, some guerrilla marketing. Um, but but I would I would uh, point out to they hide we seek that one of the prevalent well I don't know if you can call it prevalent but one of the ideas I've seen out there is that some people would respond to to that argument and say well the Mandela effect is being caused by like a cosmic hacker as it were uh, that has figured out how to alter the holographic code slash refresh rate and if you haven't seen the video where I, I it's in the medium as a message where I kind of go over the refresh rate and how if you view the, the refresh rate of your television screen or your computer screen or a film, like a movie screen, um, the, your, your mind, it, it, the refresh rate is such that your mind views it as a single continuous moving image. But it's, that's really not what a film is doing. It's still images that are, that are filtered through at such a rate that they are perceived as moving. Um, and so you could see how if, if there was a intelligence out there that had figured out how to sort of manipulate that refresh rate, the way our eyes decode that refresh rate, it might be able to insert into or alter physical matter in that way. And I just bring that up because that's not what I think is happening here. I think, as I say, this is a decent thought, uh, thought experiment, but, but just outside of this psychological operation that we'll get into as we go, I think can be explained much easier than that. And, and much more obviously. Um, I think that thought is a thought experiment outside of this context is still sort of valid because there, there, there is likely an element of that going on in the manip manipulation of our reality in general. Um, but like, as, as you were saying, like, I, I don't think there was any, any like physical manipulation uh, I agree with you that there was no physical manipulation of the the objects themselves, and we'll get into why I think that's the case. But but I, that comment that you made really kind of uh, 
kind of sparked a thought that that led to the conclusion that I make in this video. So I wanted to acknowledge it, it acknowledge it here. And and also, you know, to your point about um, the the uh, the way that Google would be able to uh, acquire information um, from all of the most commonly misspelled names and and all and brands and all of that. Um, and going back to the comment about this being about is this the new way to refer to things from the nineties? It's like, well, yeah, you, you notice how a lot of these Mandela effects involve things that are from, uh, relatively speaking a long time ago, because that, that allowed them to acquire the information over time. Like if they were doing a study, they would have seen what people were misspelling over the years, especially as the internet became more and more popular. And then they would have been able to, to pin down which ones they were going to manipulate in this fashion. Now, of course, certain things, and that's just the that just applies to the ones that are I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but that just applies to the ones that are uh, misspellings. Then you have ones like the Star Wars uh, stuff from the movies. You know, that's that's from 1977. You know, like uh, they plan they've been planning that one for a long time. So it varies depending on which um, category you're you're talking about here, whether it be, you know, movies, uh, movie quotes or misspelled names, brands, uh, maps, Bible verses, whatever. Um, so moving on. Then uh, Banazir had, uh, had a comment that really, I mean, this was a great comment. Um, and well, <laughs> it's not necessarily this one, but they deleted your other one. So I don't remember exactly what that said, but luckily I got the concept before it was deleted because this is the one that really like the light bulb went off, the sparks flew, and I was like, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. Um, so he says, my take on the Mandela effect is that everything always was as it appears now, but all along through means unbeknownst to us, all unbeknownst to us all, we were somehow subliminally fed these subtle little changes right from the get go. Uh, indeed, a, a psyop time to coincide with the so-called flat earth, flat earth resurgence. And then there's a, there was a comment from KR who made the observation uh, you see, the likely scenario is that everyone integrated these misspellings into their own vocabulary and committed typo after typo, further imprinting it into our brains as factual and giving us a false sense of having some type of photographic memory that tells the truth. And in, in the comment, KR goes on to talk about a series called Brain Games. And I think um, we'll, we'll see as we go along that there the brain game stuff, a lot of it was, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, and I, I really want to at some point, but I think we'll see that the stuff that they're showing is from research that was done before it, and we're going to go over that research. Um, so just combining all of the, these things, uh, you know, with kind of my own ideas of what's going on, uh, we have, so it, it's Mandela Inception, or subliminal interference with pre-existing memories via subsequent quote-unquote incorrect references. And that would have been Banazir's piece. The Loftus research on the malleability of memories, uh, and uh, the, the research I'm talking about is from Elizabeth, Elizabeth Loftus, and we'll get into that. Uh, the Loftus research on the malleability of memories explains how this tactic would be used in combination with data on popular misspellings, and that was kind of they hide, we seek's comment. Um, or observation, and then I put dilemma, dilemma here because that's a that's a prime example of this. Um, that, that's a prime example of something that the overwhelming majority of the people in America, because this is uh, no one has proven to me otherwise that this is some sort of uh, worldwide phenomena. This is targeted at America and 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 the. And countries like Canada and Australia and Great Britain that are very, you know, heavily influenced by American culture. Um, but the, the, so the over, overwhelming majority of people would be spelling it if they were just sounding it out in their mind and typing into a search engine. They'd be going dilemma. Let's see, dilemma. D I L E M M A. Dilemma. Yeah, that's right. And and so, but everybody who maybe was. Um, was very good at spelling or kind of had like uh, had a writing intensive uh, scholastic experience. Like, you know, that when you were learning English and, and like learning how to write and learning all these new words, 
Dilemma was, or, see, I just said it there. I just made my point. Dilemma was one that really stood out because in order to get the spelling right, you had to make the mnemonic in your mind that was like, okay, Dilemma. I know it's Dilemna. So, so you sit there. I actually even say it in my head, Dilemna, when I, when I look at the word, even though I know it's Dilemma. So that's a perfect, perfect example of one that they would have looked at and said, okay, everyone's spelling this word as Dilemma. If we just change the official record of all these dictionaries online and say it's Dilemma, then we'll have all these people convinced that they were just wrong this whole time, and that'll fuel the Mandela Effect narrative. From This would be one of the legitimate examples of it. Um, so the Loftus research on the malleability of memories explains how this tactic would be used in combination with data on popular misspellings and syllabic ambiguities like uh, I, I go into this in a comment that I made on that uh, on the last Mandela Effect video in regards to Forrest Gump. Um, so you have examples like sex in versus and the city. And, and really, you know, what you have left is just, uh, it's just um, sex in the city. And you can see how the, the N syllable is what lingers in your auditory uh, memory. It's sex in the city, sex in the city, sex in the city. You say it really fast. And it could be either of them. Even if it was always and, you would say sex in the city. Sex in the city. <laughs> so you see how that auditory uh, memory is so uh, malleable and so open to interpretation depending, because the syllable is the same, that it makes it a perfect candidate um, uh, for this psychological operation. And moreover, to the point about people who type it into a search engine, there's probably, because of that ambiguity, there's probably a big split between people spelling it in versus and. Um, and then, yeah, so Forrest Gump was another example. Um, life was slash is like a box of chocolates. And in that same comment, I go into the idea about how, um, well, in Forrest Gump, he said that the mother, his mother, the, that Sally Fields character, later in the movie says, life is like a box of chocolates. And Forrest Gump, when he's on the bench, says life was like a box of chocolates. And again, it's this, it's this heavy slang where he's saying uh, life's like a, a, a box of chocolates. Um. I don't even think. Um, so, so the point being that um, again, it's this, it's the same thing as Sex in the City, where you're saying life's like a box of chocolates. It's, it's that S memory uh, in your in your auditory memory that remembers that, and then that's that's kind of, uh, and then we'll we'll get down as we go um, to Kr's point about how because of this auditory ambiguity with the syllable, you form this, this visual memory of him saying it like you remember it in that way, you see? Even if that's wrong, you create that memory. Um, and, and the people who are analyzing life is like a box of chocolates, they'll, they'll point to the back of the VHS, VHS box, which says life is like a box of chocolates. And that you know you could you could view that one of two ways as i say in the comment like you know either they act like actually edited Forrest Gump saying is to was uh or that's just a quote from the Sally Field character and then uh to Bandazir's point it's then referenced in pop culture like over and over and over again as life is like a box of chocolates and then after that successive imprinting over the years you form that that auditory and visual memory of him sitting on that park bench saying life is like a box of chocolates. So you can see how if if he always said life was like a box of chocolates, th this that is a perfect choice for this psychological operation because it's so ambiguous in terms of everything that I just went over. It's I have to say it's brilliant. It really is brilliant. Um, so moving on. Some of these effects are obviously false and easily disproven if your memory of them has not been interfered with. And I put Field of Dreams in here, and I'll go back to that in a second. But if you only have a loose pop culture reference memory of them, including like maps and Bible verses, 
it is easy to believe that you quote unquote know what something was because your awareness creates a photographic or visual memory of the newer information. And that was kind of KR's point. So you can see how all of these are, are all of these are, um, all these ideas are, are, are interacting with each other in, in, as a form of subliminal interference with pre-existing memories. Uh, you know, they're, they're quote unquote incorrect. Um, and so they're interfering with your original viewing of the movie quote um, or whatever, the brand name, the, um, the maps, the, the Bible verses, whatever. And... Yeah, before I do that, I'll go into field of dreams. Like, if I had known about this field of dreams issue before I did the first video, I think I might have caught on to this. But this this really opened my eyes to what's going on here because I, I just from viewing everyone talking about it, I know that they're just being they're just being influenced by the Mandela effect narrative. And again, because it, it's that that similar uh, syllabic uh, similarity where it's uh, he, they, he, they. And it's if you build a he, 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 they will come, you know, like it's very similar. Um, so, so and what they do with Field of Dreams is they say, uh, look, I got a I got an example of it. I'll, uh, I'll bring that up and see if I can find that. Here. Um, so people are talking about it. And like this comment says. I see it as the hundreds cars and people showing up to the farm at the movie's ending is the meaning they will come. Um, and that's, and so you see the insanity of this whole thing where not that this person is insane, but the insanity of the narrative itself, where they get you like interpreting the movie in a way that will fit this narrative that they give you, right? Like, Oh yeah, it was always they because it's about the cars that come at the end. And it's like, no, if you're saying that, I know that you haven't seen the movie in a, like more than one time or in a very long time. Um, the movie is about his his relationship with his father. The whole reason, the the, the <laughs> okay, the first line of the movie is about his father. If you build it, he will come. Is referring to his father, and it's not just said twice. In, in when he's in the cornfield in that whisper it is then repeated by ray and his wife when they're in the kitchen it's repeated two, uh, two more times uh there and then again it's repeated at the end of the movie when ray is looking uh uh talking to um Sh shoeless joe jackson's character uh ray liotta that's confusing because it's ray liotta and then the character's name's ray but ray kinsella is talking to shoeless joe jackson and he says um and Shoeless Joe Jackson looks at him and says, if you build it, turns to his father and says, he will come. <laughs> okay, like, that is what the movie is about. There's, and there's a portion in the movie when Ray is like, uh, he's talking to his wife and they're in bed and he's saying, uh, you know, I'm scared that I'm becoming my father. And, and, and then as the movie progresses, you find out that he, uh, he said an awful thing to his father about Shoeless Joe Jackson and who was his father's hero. And he he kind of had this rebellion when he read Terrence Mann's book. And you can see how all of the characters are related to this. The second voice is ease his pain. He's talking about his father. Um, uh, or he's talking about Ray, depending on how you look at it, or the voice is talking about that. Um, so, no, that is not what the movie... If, if you build it, they will come makes no sense. That's not what the movie is about. It was always he... And I simply will not accept your argument that you are from another timeline where it was they, because as I just explained to you, it logically makes no sense in the context of the movie. So that really opened my eyes to what is going on here. Oh, and just a side note, like on how stupid the Mandela effect is as a, as a thing that we're doing. Um, we're sitting here debating a, 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 whether a quote was one word or the other when the movie Field of Dreams is, it's, it's a Masonic masterpiece. It is so deep on so many levels um, that I, I could do a, a whole thing on it. Like, I'm not going to do that right now. But, you know, if we're going to discuss toxic pop culture, we, we should at least be discussing the subliminally <laughs> implanted, cabalistic, uh, ancient mythology that is embedded within it. You know, that's what we should be discussing, if anything. Um, not the, the movie quote. 
but uh but but just on that one point before I go on, if if you want to kind of think about that movie, I mean, just on a base level, it's a brilliant movie. Like it's a it's my it was my favorite movie growing up. It's brilliant. Um but if you want to contemplate the deeper meaning on it, um there's a there's a lot towards the end of the movie when when Ray is talking to Shulis Joe Jackson, he uh he says, It was you. And uh, Shoeless Joe responds, no, Ray, it was you. Um, ruminate on that in the context of the movie. It gets into some deep shit. Look, the line of cars at the end of the movie is the, is the lightning bolt. It's the lightning flash of creation. And the, and the, the fucking, a baseball field is mas, as Masonic as it gets. I mean, if you can look into the dimensions of a baseball field, it's the square and compass, man. Anyway, I'm, I'm losing focus. So... Once I saw that this was a supposed Mandela effect, I knew for sure that that this is not this is not accurate and 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 then I was able to get a window into people that think they know what they're talking about, but really they're just going off of these random pop culture references of the event that they have. Um and then like that's this this second comment, just a quick comment on Field of Dreams when Kevin Costner first starts hearing the voice he's hearing if you build it they will come which is not true it's only later in the movie that he hears a particular line that says if you build it he will come referring to his father and uh no that's that's not the only time it's repeated and uh then of course he goes on to say no i haven't uh, seen the movie since the mandela effect came into play um so again it's like people are just making up things to fit these narratives you know and they're not they have no real memory of it is is my point but, uh, so when I, when I found that out, I was like, okay, there's, excuse me, there's something nef really nefarious at foot here. And that kind of got me to revise my, my idea, but in combination with all the comments that were left, it kind of got me to revise my idea of what's, uh, taking place here. Um, so we have setting up the Mandela effect psychological operation, specifically the dialectic. Uh, for And just as we go here, for a loose comparative example, the same process was used to set up the prefabricated religion versus atheism talking point. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind about how that was all set up, uh, because they're doing a similar thing here. So one side is the skeptic slash rational appeal to simple confabulation, which is just a fancy word for bad memory. Um, while the other side contains the narrative surrounding ideas of alternative reality universes colliding, quantum jumping, you know all of them if you've been looking into this. Um, within this dialectic, a majority of the quote-unquote effects were artificially created so that they could be easily disproven, such that a portion of the people exposed to this PSYOP will dismiss the concept as simply poor memory, by association dismissing the concept of conspiracy theories in general. And this is just a standard tactic that they use all throughout the internet in every category of information that you can imagine. Um, and this also explains why they would have the Mandela effect come to fruition right alongside the uh, fabricated flat earth resurgence. Because um, that's doing the same thing, just on another level. Um, uh, because when you are when you get into the Mandela effect, it does rate, like, some of the things that are talked about are, uh, like, as far as what consciousness is, what what awareness is, what this reality is. I mean, those are questions that I ask myself every fucking day. Like, that's a worthwhile inquir inquiry. But what, as I went into in the last video, so I, I, you know, I won't get too much into that now. It's they, they are using the Mandela effect as a way to pigeonhole that sort of analysis into quantum physics and uh, and quantum ideas about what this reality is. Okay. But but having that inquiry outside of that narrow pigeonhole is 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 valuable. Not not what they are trying to shape it as. Um, a much smaller portion of the effects will be real dilemma dilemma, and these will be used to create a segment of quote unquote true believers who evangelize the concept in opposition to the bad memory skeptics and who likewise popular popularize all of the fabricated effects as the disinformation networks quote unquote lead the witness as it were. In other words, while the true believers are correct in pointing out that the skeptics quote unquote don't get it, 
What they don't understand is that the skeptics are simultaneously correct in pointing out that the true believers have been similarly hypnotized into false memories. And so returning to the religion analogy, there are a minority of real teachings in the Bible which fuel the true believers uh, just subconsciously. And uh, there is a majority of bad information that is easily made fun of that fuels, when taken literally, that fuels the atheist skeptics. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Loftus and the misinformation effect. You can't make this up, up in parentheses because you can't make it up. So um, we're going to get into, into, uh, into her research. But by, after getting into her research, my speculative hypothesis is this research on memory and the misinformation effect was used to carefully design quote-unquote effects that best exploited the fabricated dichotomy between skeptics and true belie believers. Uh, and then you have the data collection of common spelling errors uh, combining with the syllabic similarity that we were talking about earlier. It is regression hypnosis via pop culture, i.e. subconscious inception. In other words, this intelligence provides residual evidence of the incept incepted memories in order to fuel the quote-unquote incorrect memories of the true believers which is why there are digital copies, um, easily manipulated or planted, of the quote-unquote original and quote-unquote correct memory in old newspapers slash magazines. J.C. Penney was the last one I wanted to talk about just because it's obviously always been J.C.P.E.N.N.E.Y. Um, but then even the people that are supposedly giving out this information are subliminally imprinting you with the supposed correct version. You know what I mean? Like why you pick that thumbnail for your video and then you ask people to vote on which one it is. You know what I mean? Like, so you've subliminally implanted them with the uh, correct version uh, before they even vote. You know what I mean? And, and this person's response is like, Oh, I'm not arguing that it's always, it's a familiar response. I'm not arguing that it's not EY in this reality, but it wasn't in mine. I've shifted into this one. And then he, he ties that into um, a consciousness shift. As if, I, I got to go a little bit on a rant here. A, as if a consciousness or a shift in awareness on the level that these ancient traditions are talking about would involve, the, the extent of it would be, you would have a, a different memory of pop culture bullshit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or a Bible verse or a map. You know, uh, come on, man. It's not going to be something as ridiculous as that and or trivial, trivial as that. And I know the response to that's going to be, well, that would just be the first, the start of it. This is just the beginning. It's like, no, no, it's not. Um, anyway, that's enough of that. Um, and then I, there was also a picture I found at JCPenney where they literally have the E in blue against this blue background um so it, and of course a penny like every kid that grew up in america or any english speaking or whatever who had a penny um in in their language like especially the 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 age group that is like my age group where yeah we actually grew up with physical cash i fucking counted pennies when i was younger like you just have that that image of a penny in your mind um and, and that is spelled, of course, P-E-N-N-Y. So how easy would it be to mistake J.C. Penny for P-E-N-N-Y, right? But this is kind of like, just imagine if they were subliminally doing this, like kind of shading the E without you knowing it um, to get you to kind of like think that it was always like this. That This one really made me laugh. I mean, the store doing this is no different than that quote-unquote Mandela effect researcher uh, doing that with the thumbnail or any of the other people who Photoshop this stuff. Um, let's see here. Moving on. I think this is the third time I'm going to read this sentence, but I will do it for continuity's sake. This intelligence provides residual evidence of the incepted memories in order to fuel the quote-unquote incorrect memories of the true believers, which is why there are digital copies, easily manipulated, planted, of the quote-unquote original and quote-unquote correct memory in old newspaper magazines, which we just went over, Plus Photoshop, like Depends, potential Photoshop, like Depends, JCPenney, Fruit Loops. Thus proving to the true believers that their awareness is uh, shifted from a different universe or timeline, 
even though this is not proof of that in the first place, as logically, if this transpired, there would be no physical evidence of the quote unquote correct memory that you brought with you into this new reality. Uh, to me, this is the smoking gun, which indicates a psyop is taking place. And you'll see people make this argument all the time. They just, they repeatedly make the, the mistaken argument that this residual evidence is proof that the Mandela effect is, is real. And it's like, well, if what you're saying is true and your awareness shifted from another dimension where it was uh, J.C. Penny, P-E-N-N-Y, then there would be no uh, digital or print trace or, you know, anything like that of of uh, P-E-N-N-Y. It would only be in your memory, okay? There would be no footprint of it. You see what I'm saying? Um, and then this is just a note here that I probably, that maybe I should come back to. I'll come back to it. Um, Loftus, and I'll, um, let's see, where was that at? Uh, so this is Elizabeth Loftus, um, born Elizabeth Fishman, <laughs> um, an American cognitive psychologist and expert on human memory. She has conducted extensive research on the malleability of human memory. Loftus is best known for her groundbreaking work on the misinformation effect and eyewitness memory and the creation and nature of false memories, including recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. And uh, really everything that I took on her was from Wikipedia. But uh, Loftus conducted a study designed to investigate whether eyewitness memory could be altered by information supplied to the witness after an event, which later produced the misinformation effect hypothesis, where a person's recall of episodic memories becomes less accurate because of post-event information, i.e. our recall of the majority of these Mandela effects is not accurate due to the planned distribution of purposely incorrect post-memory information. The misinformation effect is a prime example of retroactive interference, which occurs when information presented later interferes with the ability to retain previously encoded information. The new information that a person receives works backward in time to distort the memory of the original event, i.e., this is the Mandela effect. It is retroactive interference with memories that was purposely designed to exploit the misinformation effect. For example, it was always, no, I am your father, but the subsequent Luke misinformation in pop culture had the effect of retroactively interfering with a majority of people's memory of the original quote. This retroactive interference is then used to convince people that they are from a different timeline, in the context of this psychological operation, that is. Moreover, I have seen a physical copy of the story of Star Wars, I, I, I stated this in a comment, uh, from 1977, on which C-3PO has a silver lower right leg. In Revenge of the Sith, C-3PO is clearly still all gold, so obviously this memory retroactively interfered with the character's depiction in the original low Def trilogy. In the context of the Mandela Effect narrative, the disinformation networks are creating their own glitches. And I have a picture here of C-3PO. This is from Revenge of the Sith. Um, and he's, you know, clearly all gold. So you can see what they did there. Like, it's so easy to explain this one, you know. Um, especially since this is in high def and everybody saw it more recently. So that new information retroactively interfered with... Uh, the old information acting as the misinformation effect. And I'm saying this, and it's explaining the Mandela effect exactly, and the, the memory researchers who did it called it the misinformation effect, you know? It's just hilarious. Um, hidden in plain sight, as usual. Recent research points to certain areas of the brain that are especially active when false memories are retrieved. In one study, Participants studied photos while experimenters monitored participants' brain activity using an fMRI. Later, in a misinformation phase, participants viewed sentences describing the studied photographs, some of which contained information conflicting with what was originally depicted in the photographs. The participants returned one day later for a surprise memory recognition test, and some reported information that had been pre presented in the later verbal misinformation, but not in the original photographs. 
and this goes back to Vehide Buisig's point about the spelling data and KR's point about the incorrect words later creating a visual memory. And in the in this Loftus research, this was taking place a day later. <laughs> We're not talking about decades later for some of these, you know what I mean? Um, so this is not about, I can see like the, the talking point that will spring up in response to this will be something along the lines of like, well, what are you saying? You can't trust your own memories? Like in the last video, you were talking about, you know, trusting your intuition. It's like, well, yes, again, it's a, when you're dealing with a magician's trick, it's a sliding scale of possibilities or probabilities. And you have to adjust those probabilities depending on the information that comes in, in the context of everything else that you already know about how disinformation networks work and how this is all fitting into the larger picture. And then you filter all of that through your intu intuition and instinct still. So I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't trust your own memories. Uh, this is about considering the possibility that your memories have been purposely targeted in a psychological operation via retroactive interference exploiting the misinformation effect. In other words, this is subconscious inception. Meaning, they, they take something like, no, I am your father, and then subconsciously Subliminally and even overtly, when you hear that you just it's only subconscious because you don't know the end goal of what they're doing at the time, right? In Tommy Boy, you hear him say, Luke, I am your father. You hear everyone say, Luke, I am your father, repeating that, you don't understand how it's going to be used against you later. So that in that way it's subliminal and subconscious. But it's happening overtly to your auditory and visual memory, and then you are it that is retroactively interfering with your original memory, if you have one at all. Of the, of the original movie line, which was, no, I am your father. And so in that way, uh, they are incepting an idea into your mind. And, and just go watch the movie Inception. And it's not a literal metaphor, but it is analogous. And how ironic that uh, Cobb's wife ends up dying because he implants the, he incepts the idea that her reality isn't real. <laughs> which is exactly what they're trying to do here. I mean, come on. Um, uh, so moving on, the misinformation effect has been examined in individuals. Oh, this is important. The misinformation effect has been examined in individuals with varying imagery abilities. Participants viewed a filmed event followed by descriptive statements of the events in a traditional three-stage misinformation paradigm. Participants with higher imagery abilities were more susceptible to the misinformation effect than those with lower abilities. So think about that for a second, and I'll say what they say. The psychologists argued that participants with higher imagery abilities were more likely to form vivid uh, images of the misleading information at encoding or at retrieval, therefore increasing susceptibility. In other words, those with borderline photographic memories or very good memories are more likely to be affected by the misinformation effect. And that's just perfect for the psychological operation because I would put myself in that category of having a good memory. And so you you are more you become a true believer, right? You're even more adamant that your your memories are correct, but really they're just exploiting your good memory and using it against you, you see. Um, it's very, very clever. And then just going back to that note that I skipped, um, skeptics will point to the Loftus research as proof, like for, you know the baseline skeptics who will just go talk about somebody discussing the Mandela effect and say, oh, you just have a bad memory. Those skeptics will point to the Loftus research as proof that your memory cannot be trusted, but this is a red herring. Uh, this intelligence, as I've kind of gone over in all of my uh, other work, this, this intelligence has understood the human mind from the beginning but it must give the illusion of a linear progress in discovery to support the narrative that, quote unquote, we created this system of civilization as a part of our, quote unquote, natural evolution in sophistication. So it's like the stuff that Loftus is disclosing about our memory, they've known that since the beginning, man. Like, that's easy. But then it eventually has to come out. And then they do the same thing in science, um, especially, you know, now in, in the realms of quantum science. Uh, or quantum philosophy about the nature of this existence. Like they slow, they slow drip like an IV stuff out there that makes it seem like we are progressing, right? That it is us that is constantly getting smarter. 
um, when I think it's becoming more and more clear that this is, has been a long-term domestication strategy uh, at work here. Um, and just going, I got to go back now to, let's see, already did that. Oh yeah, so going back to uh, Banazir's observation of this commercial, you can see dun, what they're dun, doing here. Dun, 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 dun. <sighs> Cooper, I am your father. No, 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 I am your father. Oh man, that's just hilarious. So, well, of course, well, I won't even go there. Um, so this comes out in October 2015, uh, which is right after the Mandela effect had surged in popularity in, in September, right? Um, and then this comes out, and they're just kind of rubbing it in your face, right? Like, oh, yeah, that was the original memory. And then uh, they give you the one that they retroactively uh, use to interfere with that original memory. And then they try to convince you that you have shifted from another dimension based on that. <laughs> Um, no, I'm not buying it. Sorry. Um, and then this is the newest one that just came out along those same lines. And, oh, James Earl Jones is telling a joke and he recites the line as Luke, I am your father. And now all of the true believers are going around saying, see, this is proof. And of course, this underscores a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of these actors. Um, James Earl Jones is not a real person. He's not just out there reciting this stuff. He was told to recite the line in that way as a part of this psychological operation. This is from 2014. They, they seeded this before it even happened. It was just, or before the Mandela effect became popular. It's just another step along the way, but I'll play it so you can hear it. Um, Jack Jedi says, Luke, I am your father. And so you see how brilliant that is, right? Because people who have a really unless you're like a super fan of that movie and you just know it was always no i am your father the people that that view this information th that's going to trigger an auditory memory auditory and visual memory of darth vader uh looking at luke hanging off with one hand saying luke i am your father even though that's not what he said that is the misinformation effect that's retroactive interference that is uh, you know scientifically demonstrated uh memory research uh applied to this psychological operation it's incredible uh oh yeah this was just the video that was doing that jc penny stuff just so you can see he told people to hit the up uh vote if you remember it as jc uh penny p-e-n-n-y and the majority view it that way because of all of the reasons i went into so far um so you know if you want to imagine how this kind of was functioning, think of the Mandela effect in this way. I'm going to play this whole clip. It's 141 long. I'm going to grab a drink while, it, while it's going on. But just think of the Mandela effect in this way. And, and uh, well, before, let me just read this. Excuse me. The most difficult to explain Mandela effects are, are the supposed physical changes to maps, Bible verses, car logos, Berenstein, EIN, Bears books, i.e., all things with physical objects that subsequent written audio video misinformation could produce a quote unquote wrong memory of. Let's just say that there is no telling what an organized subliminal misinformation campaign could achieve on an etheric level. And so I'll just play this, but think about the Mandela effect while you, uh, while you listen to it. Um, yeah. Hidden in plain sight. I couldn't believe when I saw this scene, I couldn't believe that they put this in a movie. <laughs> because that's what they do. I mean, that explains the whole thing. It's like, you just look at a picture like this and it's like, um, yeah, <laughs> yep, <laughs> there you go. I mean, how do you think they, how do you think, uh, they convince you that a plane fell in or uh, flew into that building, right? <laughs> so, um, the Mandela effect, that's what's going on here. I'm, I'm more, more and more convinced of that, that this has been a long-term, you know, subliminal psychological operation that is taking advantage of this this information that they have about uh, retroactive interference and the misinformation effect. And of course, they would call it the Mandela, Fiona Broom would call it the effect, right? Because it's the, it's the misinformation effect. Um, so, you know, I, I understand that a lot of people are going to be in the true believer category of this 
of this effect, but you have to understand that, that like, it's like anything else on the internet, there's going to be some of those true believers who are not genuine people. And they're there to distribute the propaganda and keep the narrative alive. So those are going to be the channels that just have Mandela effect video after Mandela effect video after Mandela effect video. And they're always talking about the next one and the next one and the next one, right? They're, they're, those are the ones that are going to further the agenda. And that's not to say that there couldn't be some genuine person that's just really interested in this. I mean, I've been caught up in plenty of psychological operations before. I'm just saying, in light of all of this, in light of the last video and this video, you really got to keep yourself grounded when you're looking into this. And you have to come at it from the, from the perspective that they are actively trying to fuck with your mind. For sure. Um, so I'll just go back and read this real quick now that we've gone over a thing, because I did get ahead of myself on some of it. So Mandela Inception or subliminal interference with pre-existing memories via subsequent quote-unquote incorrect references, the Loftus research on the malleability of memories explains how this tactic would be used in combination with data on popular misspellings, excuse me, and syllabic ambiguities, uh, like all the examples we went over. Some of these effects are obviously false and easily disproven if your memory of them has not been interfered with, but if you only have a loose pop culture reference memory of them, it is easy to believe that you know what something was because your awareness creates a photographic or visual memory of the newer information. And remember, it's affecting the people that have the best uh, photographic or visual memories more than it, it is people without them, right? What a psyop. <laughs> uh, because, and, and just in general, the people that have better photographic or visual memories are, are just in general going to be smarter than the average person because that sort of memory uh, allows you to recognize patterns and, and just sort of, um, you know, connect dots. So, I mean, this is just an incredible psychological operation. I mean, I got to tip my cap to them. I mean, next level mind war shit, no question. And if, the, and if the people that are saying this is just the first wave of it are correct, I can't wait to see what they do next, you know. Um, and I know no matter what, I said, what I've said here, there's going to be true believers who are going to say, well, what about the maps? You know, so, so much of that has changed. Um, what, what about the Bible verses? What about the car logos? Um, and, and it's like, well, look, man, I, I, again, we're examining a magician's trick on a sliding scale of probabilities. And I do still believe, even though, based on everything that I've looked into, even though there are, um, even though the overwhelming majority of these are going to be fabricated in some way, shape or form, I still think that there are a, there, there are a couple that are real um, in that they went to the, the insane uh, levels of deception in the real world that they did online um, in order to, in order to make it, in order to fuel the true believers. Right. I mean, like myself, cause I'm a true believer in some ways. Like I, no one could tell me that it wasn't dilemma. I learned it. Uh, or do, I, I'm just going to say dilemma cause you know what I mean? So I don't have to qualify it every time. And Berenstein bears is the same thing. I remember EIN. I have no idea why, but I remember it. <laughs> I do. Um, but, but, you know, Field of Dreams and Dilem Dilemna are the only ones that I would say for certain because I know from my own experience that that is correct. Uh, in other words, I, I, it is open to debate still which one of these are potentially real and which ones are just complete fabrications. But we should be working from the, uh, from the premise that the overwhelming majority are fabricated, right? So we should really be, like, discarding a lot of these as we narrow it down. Um, 